Da. Uh, bine ați venit la Sibiu Meetup. Pentru cei care n-ați mai fost, eu sunt uh, Ștefan. Mă bucur să ne cunoaștem. Asta este ultima ediție pe anul 2023 și cu asta încheiem, practic, seria de evenimente. Anul 2024 se anunță a fi la fel de productiv, cu o grămadă de evenimente mișto, posibil inclusiv lansări de carte și mai știu eu ce, nu știu, ne mai, mai vedem. Workshop-uri, chestii, o să vedem. Le programăm din timp, bineînțeles. Am uh, împlinit 5 ani de meetup în uh, noiembrie. Deci, de 5 ani se întâmplă chestia asta, în mod gratuit pentru toată lumea, cu subiecte diverse. N-ați participat la giveaway, îmi pare rău. S-a, s-a dat deja premiu. <laughs> Cam atât am avut de zis. O să mai zic chestii la final. Uh, am să-i dau cuvântul lui Nic, așa, direct. Uh, vă invit să scanați codul, până un altă, vă invit să scanați codul QR dacă vreți să aflați mai multe despre Meetup sau pentru formularul de, de Call for Speakers. Așa. Mă gândesc că știți de ce ați venit aici, pentru că ați văzut bannerul. Și până se pregătește Nic, pregătit? Hai să vedem. Deci la bariera asta nu se aude în sală, se aude doar în înregistrare, nu? Se aude în înregistrare, în principiu. Bun, stai un pic că mai avem ceva de făcut. Ia tu asta. Da. Așa. Să intri pe... Știi că era tu. E bine aici? Secundă. Asta că nu mă grăbesc. Ce ora spune vasul meu cu doi copii toată ziua? Îți dai seama că e zero șanse să-i mai zic. Mai am nevoie de câteva ore să stau plecat. Dau vina pe tine. Liniștit. Stai, Ștefan, 20 de minute să-mi seteze nu știu ce. Vorbește toată lumea engleză? Ui. Înțeles, măcar. Ui. Ready? Doamne ajută! Thank you so much for joining us for the year's last CBU Web Meetup. Plenty to come for the next year and plenty to come for you because I'm taking a break. I'm done. It's been a tough year. I really do encourage you to, to answer to Stefan's call for, for speakers and I, I do recommend the experience from the, from the bottom of my heart and I was talking before starting. The meetings that we're organizing here are not about how much you know about the topic or how prepared you are, are about we, the fact that we finally have a space, I mean this and the other tech meetup, where we can actually get to train and see how it feels. The big game that we're playing is to actually prepare people locally to act globally. And this is the only reason that I'm having this presentation in English as well. If we want to start being relevant as a city and as a community, we have to, to let people give them the chance to, to actually understand what we know and what we are about. Now, for those with whom I haven't managed to make acquaintance before starting the, the meetup, I'm Nick, I'm into software, curious. How many of you have attended my attempt, because I cannot call it otherwise, the two of you, to have the same topic delivered at the other tech meetup last month. Now, how many of you have kids? 
Whew, mommy, Tati, you understand. Nobody can actually get you prepared for having kids. They will tell you how it's like, you can read about, but you have no idea what you're getting into. I'm sure nobody, I mean, it never crossed my mind that I will also have to prepare beyond changing diapers and caring for the kid for this sort of situations. Right, my wife was in hospital with the eldest. I was at home with the little one and he was already starting showing up signs that he cut up the cold as well, right? Boogers, trolling, he already had a little fever and I don't know what was in my mind. I said, I'm gonna handle this. I've been in tougher situations. When the Euromaidan happened in Ukraine, in 2014, I, I was hosting an event there. I mean, the, 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 you could hear gunshots. We were on a venue that was pretty close to the, to the limit where, where the army closed the perimeter. And we somehow managed to, to finish that event. I mean, what else can happen worse than that? The kid at some point closed his eyes, was leaning backwards, was pointing at the door, muffled cry. And in, in, in my mind, I was supposed to, to give the speech, but in my mind was, am I a bad father for, for doing this? What, what will people will think about me, right? Is he actually okay? I mean, it could, it could be signs of meningitis. I mean, I, I should act on it properly. I tried to have one of my colleagues take the kid away, but he was crying and all I could concentrate on was my kids um, cry. And um, I mean, it was horrible at some point, I have to admit, I'm not gonna be able to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call the shot. I'm gonna call it today, say sorry, and go home. It took me two days to muster the courage to write to my team and tell them that I'm sorry. And when I did that, I mean, they come back and they said, hey man, it was okay. You got the best grading we ever had in the feedback form. Right? My presentation was a complete failure, but the kid was a hit. It's him who you guys want back on the stage, not me. Have I learned my lesson, you think? No, my eldest one was pretty close to, to being present here today. Luckily, he had other plans. I have to, to, to give it to him and, and let him at home watching Bleep You on TV. So here I am now. I've already delivered this talk in, uh, in September. It was a bit different. The idea that I had and the presentation that I put together was nothing like the one that I actually delivered. It was straight to the point, short and simple, very technical, no fluff. But I made a mistake to get there one day earlier, and I had the chance to attend the networking dinner with the other speakers. Now the lineup looked like this. There were people from Google, Facebook, Rafino, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Spotify. Who else was there? Many others, right? Revolut as well on the same stage as me? Yeah. And I mean, I had the opportunity to chat with these people and I considered it as privilege. I'm gonna finally sit at the table with people that I can actually complain about the things that I think go wrong with the technology that they are promoting to, to all of us, the technology that we're consuming. But I didn't get very far. I mean, they were more interesting in discussing their conversations between each other. I mean, they were, they were talking these bad diets stuff that I don't understand. And whenever I try to actually make the, the conversation meaningful, for me at least, right? Everyone is interested in their own things. I mean, I got answers like, you know what? I mean, I, I don't know and I don't care. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm paid to do my job. I do my job, I close the computer and I go have my chai latte, my mate, whatever they, they were talking about. I don't know if we even have that in, in our city, probably. Okay, I mean, you, you're doing your job and you don't care about it, but I mean, this is the technology that you guys created and you're pushing it on people. Oh, no, 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 no. Calm down. We are not. I mean, we, we got our tasks, we, we commit, and we call it today. There are other people in R&D departments that are actually mandated to create this technology. All right, you're not creating it, but you are promoting it. No, I mean, we don't care that much whether we work at Facebook and promoting React and stuff. I mean, there are other people that are doing this. And they're the technical evangelists that are paid specifically to promote tech to you guys. And this is how, I mean, you should realize that the, this is how great the disconnect is, I mean, in, in, the, in the companies that drive our community as a whole.
I mean, I wasn't okay with that. I went straight home to the hotel, actually. And not actually straight because I stayed for a couple of more beers. But then I went back to the hotel and I rehauled the entire presentation. I mean, I was angry. I mean, this is not how the people that are feeding tech leadership to us are supposed to, to behave, right? This is not software craftsmanship. A software craftsman should care about leaving the code base that they work with in a better state, the knowledge that they're providing to the community in, in, in a higher state. And they are not about that. They, they, they should care about the tools that they work with and how they influence other people. And I slapped the whole, that's the moment where I slapped the software craftsmanship bit on my presentation. It helped a little because DCI is pretty much about that, about finding a better way to go about what we consider is the best we got. And the problem with the best we got, and it's not our fault because, I mean, we were born into the system. This is what we found when we came here. There were people that we considered smarter than us, more experienced than us, that said, this is the way to go, right? And the best KPA that we are using is the LinkedIn search hit, right? Whatever tech is most sought after, that must be the best solution. If there are more React jobs, it means that that's the best computer rationality that has been put in creating the technology. And that's it. And the assumption is completely wrong. I'm going to give you a short example. And you guys who have already attended, that was the last bit right, that you could get from me. Because I, then I went straight home and the next day to the hospital. <laughs> you know C++. There's a chance you know the name of Bjorn Sostup, which is the creator of C++. Right? He was writing C at the Bell Labs. And he had a problem. I mean, I'm having this constant problem when I, I try extremely hard not to end with spaghetti code. I mean, I have to review my entire code base to make sure that I have not used a variable name or a method name in some other place of my application. There must be a way to go about encapsulating code. And he was looking around, he was asking around. I mean, he was doing his research. The internet was not as expansive as it is today. But he came over a magazine, a very popular magazine, computer science magazine at that time. And on the cover, big and bold, there was a programming language. You know which one? Small talk. There were many others, object-oriented programming language. Small talk was an object-oriented programming language. He took a look at it and he said, oh, objects actually solve my problem. Now all the methods and the data, the behavior and the data are encapsulated within that object. I do not have to worry about whether I have reused this some other place in my application. I'm going to go with that. And he came up with, no. The first iteration was called seaweed classes. And it was a flop. Nobody wanted classes. And he was the only one using it. There was a small consortium that was experimenting with it, trying to take it from theory to practice, but it was not a success. C++ became C++ when he slapped on some extra functionality that has nothing to do with classes, that actually had some appeal for the development community and made C++, which for a long, long time was the most popular and, and most broadly used programming language. And then Java came in and said, we need to get some some, 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 some market reach. And we need to create a language to capture our own tribe of developers, put them on our own Microsoft systems. But if we are creating one, it must appeal to C++ because that's where all the engineers are. And C++ has classes. We're going to make a language with classes too. And then Java came in, the Java, C Sharp, right? And made a precise exact clone of of, of Java, and then there were many other languages coming afterwards, all including some form or another of classes. Later, Bjarne was in an interview, and he was asked about this precise history, how he came up with C++, and he told the magazine story. But he also said, you know what? There were other more popular languages at that time, and one of that 
was similar. That was also a potential solution for my encapsulation problem. And what it was using was modules instead of objects. And that's what I needed. It was never a matter of the best possible available computer science rationality that created the ecosystem that we are working with right now. It was just a matter of randomness of historicity and marketing. It was small talk that was on the, on the magazine. So if you believe that what we got is the best we could get, I mean, my invitation is to be a true software craftsman and investigate how did we get here and is there a better way to go about our daily jobs. And this CI is precisely one of these take. Is there a better way to go about software architecture? What this CI feels, it feels like a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? Yeah, right? Once you get a paradigm shift, your newly acquire, acquired understanding is clear, clear. Everything starts to make sense. More even, you can't believe that you were thinking otherwise at any point in time. The problem with the paradigm shift is that to reach the tipping point, it's very dependable on your very subjective life experience. Right? You work with certain languages, you've been for a longer time in the industry, or you, you just joined us. It, it depends. You need a context to be able to reach this paradigm shift. Whew. But we are sort of rushing. We're already talking, talking about paradigm shifts. Let's start to anchor with something that we are all familiar with. How many of you have heard about this gentleman, Trick V. Rinskog? But you are all definitely familiar with his brainchild, the MVC, the Model View Controller. All right, Trick V was a craftsman. He had the problem and he was looking for a solution. And what he came with was MVC. The problem was, we need a way for the, for, for the users, for the developers, to reason about big, complex data sets. And the format was obtained by asking the question, where? Where is my data? Where can I see it? Where can I tamper with it? And it worked well, but it only worked for use cases that were isolated and small enough not to care about the bigger pictures and how they interact among each other. So he realized, I, I'm, I created something that works for the question that I'm asking, where? But in order to be able to do true software architectures, I'm leaving two important questions on the table, which is what my system is and what it does. I know where it is, but what it, what it, what it does. And that's when he came with DCI as a concept. I mean, DCI is complementary to MVC. It is not meant to be replaced. But he said, I've done something that is incomplete and now I have the solution. And yet, after more than 40 years, everybody knows and uses MVC. Barely anyone heard can talk about using the CI. Problem was that we can now split the systems that we are designing into domains that can enable me to, to design my software. And we have data, we have the context, and we have the interactions, which whose manifestations appear as a role in terminology later on. But the tooling that I have available at this time are not satisfactory for me to actually put it to good use. And the assumptions that we are making, Trick was big on object orientation, the true sort of object orientation that Alan Kay envisioned. So the object orientation that we have today is not satisfactory. The C++ is and, and the small talks that we're using do not enable me to actually reason about my system in terms of data, context, and interaction. And the assumptions that enables us to, to reason about this bottleneck are we haven't done object orientation properly. We are not even 
doing object orientation because when was the last time you did object oriented programming? Is the question. Should. Ah, today, yes, sir. When? When was that? I mean, you know the topic. <laughs> Don't give it away. <laughs> what languages are you are you programming in? Are you all programmers? Java. All right, you're doing Java. And for my Java for Microsoft. All right, C sharp. I mean, C sharp is going in a in a very right direction. I mean, they they do have this baggage behind them, right? The big evil corp, but they're actually doing doing the right thing about their ecosystem. But we're taking Java, for example. I mean, I got, I mean, I delivered this before. I had answers. All right, up to yesterday, I was doing OP. What sort of OP you were doing? Well, I was writing a class. Well, how was that OP? You're writing a class, not an object. Uh, is not that OP, writing classes? In a Java class, there is no way for that class from its interior to be aware of its containing objects. Imagine a Java class, right? Or whatever sort of other class is. You never ever think about its containing objects. You are not writing algorithms about objects interacting with each other. That's what the runtime does. So the runtime does object oriented programming. If you're not able to reason about your system in terms of how the objects interact among each other, not the classes, those are just blueprints, you're not doing object oriented programming. Because the initial vision of K was that. Object-oriented programming meant to allow us to design systems by replicating the real life was about objects coming together and interacting in these constellations where they each get together to attain a very specific use case. The interactions between these constellations, between these systems, that's the software architecture design. Whereas class-oriented programming, it's all about classification, hierarchization, the real life is not all about hierarchies. We got here together for a common goal, but there's no subordination, right? If I were to put you here together to, to, to list out all the hierarchies between each other, I mean, we're gonna give you a pretty simple answer, right? We are derived for, from, from monkeys, we're all humans or something like that. How much information does that gives us about the use case that we're experiencing right now? Very little. The problem, another problem, is that a class is supposed to have all the information necessary to be able to create an algorithm, because that's what we're actually doing as programmers. We're creating algorithms. Not only create React new app, and that's it. Hand it over to the client, that's your application. We got behavior and data put in the same place, and that's your model of the real life. Now, that thing does not work, and I'm going to give you an example. What is this? A tire is the question. What does it do? It rotates. I mean, that's the, the right answer. It's the right answer. It rotates, right? It propositates the, the car forward. How about now? What are those? Tires. What do they do? All right. Think your algorithm. Think your algorithm. Think your hierarchy. How about now? Still a tire? It's still a tire. The real life is fantastic. We can be very creative about how we go about the challenges that we encounter. You get the idea. Let me give you yet another example. You came home after a long day at work, coding all day. And I'm going to do my usual routine. I'm going to pull out one of my best bottles of red dry wine. That's what I like. I'm going to get one of my finest wine cups. I'm going to pour myself a glass, sit in my armchair, relax, and I start sipping. Wife is in the same room. 
All of a sudden, a mouse comes in. My wife freaks out. I get scared. Put the wine on my shirt. But I react just in time. And I, I trap the mouse. What am I holding? A mouse trapper? Or is my same old fine glass? How the hell do I design this real world use case with class oriented programming? My cup's behavior is to hold my beverage. Do I have to create some sort of hierarchy where it actually is designed to trap mice? What do I do? Do I create a, a parent class that I derive two systems? Who the hell creates in the real world a glass for trapping mice? One with the behavior of an alcoholic to, ena to enable an alcoholic, right? And the other one to, to catch critters around the household. Am I creating these two systems? No, it's just one cup. It's the same cup. I did not produce another. Are we doing some quantic shit? Or, I mean, the same lighting existing at the same time in, in different planes of existence? Class-oriented programming does poor at enabling the vision of OOP. There's very few real world scenarios that we can actually enable through OOP. I'm gonna give you yet another example. So many examples today. The thing is, your mom probably doesn't give a damn you're a developer, right? Unless she has some sort of weird fixation. But even in that case, I mean, most parents would wish for you to be a doctor or something like that. Same long hours, but more prestige. Let's go into the thick of it. I'm coming up with a, with a scenario. We can stimulate that to a context in DCI. I've written it in PHP for a very specific purpose to annoy the people at Revolut and Spotify, but also because it sort of enables us to do some DCI until it fails miserably at some point. But this is a context, right? And the algorithm says, I'm going home. And my mom greets me and says, son, my, my internet does not work. Have you deleted the Internet Explorer icon again? No, it's a problem with the wireless. They fix it. Can you see the code? It's, it's quite bleach. But then, my poor mother, instead of attending the stove, she watches me, right? Like, she would actually learn how to do it herself next time. And she leaves the stove unattended with food on it, and it catches on fire. Ah, help me. I need help put out the fire. So I rush there, and I put out the fire. How do I design that class, son, again? Do I have to be a computer science graduate to fix the damn wireless? Do I have some sort of professional training to put out the fire? Absolutely not. Are we doing the same split personality exercise again? Do you know there's, I mean, there's a, there's a term in computer science, in, in object-oriented programming, when you have the precise same object in terms of algorithm that believes he is two different things at the same time, and that's object schizophrenia. Right. And it can be enabled quite easily through all the pattern designs we got, right? We got a book like this called Gang of Four. Funny story about that book as well. Talking about context, even the wireless fixing is quite different if you are asked to fix the internet at home versus if you were asked to fix the internet in one of the Amazon data centers. Right? Same method, completely different algorithms. Probably same person doing it. That, that might be my day job. What DCI suggests is that we separate data from behavior. Behavior is not supposed to be in the same place with the data. Because, yet another example, I love this. Imagine you're building a house. A house has what? Walls. A roof, right? Furniture, all this sort of stuff. Now, 
in this house from an architectural point of view. Some of the layers change more often than others. We might change the color, the painting on the walls, more often. And the kids' room could be pink or blue, depending whether you have a boy or a girl. The master bedroom has to be white at all times, that's what my wife says. What if I want to change the color? Do I have to tear down the walls? The walls could be the structure, the behavior, what, what tells me whether it's the master bedroom or the kids' room is the color, that's the behavior. And behavior changes more often than data does. Because behavior is contextual. We're talking about context. Having to interfere in the same place and make data support the stress that it takes to alter the behavior on the class is what creates stress in the system. How the hell do we do that with the tools that we have? Continuing with the PHP example, how many of you are familiar with, with PHP to, to any degree? All right, good, I didn't expect that. I expected you guys are all corporate C Sharp and Java guys. We can try to mock the behavior. We can try to use traits, right? These are not dependent on the class itself. It can be injected in the class. Problem, see, it can be injected in the class, not in the object. But let's try to be inventive about it. All right, we're gonna make an, an anonymous class. We're initiating in that moment the class has no clue about its behavior until it's being initiated. If we were to have an existing class object, we would just pass that instead of a, of a new anonymous object. And then in the trade, we would also have to have some sort of contract for it to be able to be implemented. There's no way to do it in PHP. We're going to do a check if it needs to be able to speak in order to, to complete our algorithm that enables us to tell our mom, mom, my job here is done. And then something like this. What DCI does, different, is that it puts above everything else human mental models and improved system comprehension. Now, this scenario here is it's, it's closer to the human mental mon model boundaries. I mean, we got the whole algorithm. We know what the context is, we see the algorithm, and we can assign the very specific roles that we are required for that data for, for those actors that are participating in the scenario here in this context. But it's not that simple. Because there are some constraints. And those are, does the laser work on this thing? Yes and no. All right. Roles must be context dependent. Fixing the internet at home is not the same thing as fixing the internet at the Amazon data center. It's not on the class, but it must be on the context. Our traits are not on the context. They're global. But the role must be played by the player. There's a problem that I will outline later on, which is called strict assertion in object identity. Computer science graduates, objects are made of data, behavior, and identity, right? Because they need to know who's who at the runtime. And we must clean up any roles injected previously before moving into another context because we played as the sun when we went to our mom's house. But then, the same me know some other alternative universe version of me could go. I mean, the previous slide, right, son? The next slide, animations went to hell when I exported the presentation from Slice PowerPoint. We are now in a different scenario. That could happen in the same thing, in the same execution lifecycle. And I'm now a speaker. I mean, that's the same E, the same object. No reason for me to carry all the algorithm that enables me to put out the fire and fix my mom's wireless. So we need to have some sort of cleanup procedures 
I mean, like this is code that I put together just for the scope of the of the presentation. There are actually two implementation of DCI and PHP. You can find those on the GitHub, right? Both incomplete, but do a better job than what I did here. But I mean, I found a way to bind the roles, and I found a way to remove the roles. And there's also some setup to make sure that I I have a stack of contexts that are executed in the right order, and I clean up in before. Don't bother. Don't 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 go into that. And we, 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 we have we have what DCA says we need to be able to, to reason about our systems better. We have context, we have roles, and we have data. That's it. But only if it could be that simple. Because we are creating additional burdens. I mean, I, I did all that misery there just to, to be able to, to get closer to the goal of DCI, not even achieving it completely. And the problem with shape is that the, the, the problem with implementation is that we are altering the shape. Like we, I said that it should enable a closer journey from what we have in our heads to what we put into the algorithm that our computer runs. I mean, if we were to have people on board and, and have them look, it works, but it, it, it only works this much. And you have to have all this setup in place that, I mean, we're going to have to maintain it as well, right? We're not doing a good job. And shape is extremely important. We need to look up our code and see exactly what the use case is meant to be in the system, right? You take a use case for your clients, and it should look like your code here. I mean, that's the use case. Are you guys working with use cases? Hope not, hope not story, user stories. <laughs> the hell are those? But we got actors, we got preconditions, we got post conditions. Right, we got a setup, we got expected results and stuff like that. I mean, in the best case scenario, a DCI program looks pretty much like the use case that you've been handed over from your client. Right? In the best case scenario, you should give him the code and says, yes, it's mat it, it matches my use case. I mean, I can look at both files, I can look at the Excel template and at your code file, and I do understand. Why are you doing that there? I don't know the algorithm, but I see that you're calling the, the, the wrong type of actor or you employing the wrong type of method. I, I never wanted it to fix the wireless. The problem with shape is that this is our main way as humans to reason about our environment. I mean, on the left, you have a house. If I were to ask you to imagine a house, even if you lived in an apartment building your whole life, you would still have some sort of prototype where you would draw like a square and a triangle on top of it, that's a house. The one on the left is a bigger house, has more triangles, but we can still very easily reason about its goal. It's a house. We could make it a hundred times bigger. It might look like the Hefner mansion, but it's still a house. There are people in it. On the other hand, the one on the right, it's a, it's a modern house. All right? I mean, rich people among you, Danny, where is he? I have one. <laughs> but if we were to make that a hundred times bigger, most definitely not a house anymore if we look at it, would be the EMAG warehouses, right? Or that doomsday grain silo in Norway, but it's not a house anymore. That's what happens with our code bases. That's why when it scales, it might be harder to maintain because we don't know what they're doing anymore just by looking at it. And that's why we have to test unit everything. <laughs> because we rely on the computer to know better to catch the bugs. Because I mean, I'm looking at what I wrote. I have no clue what's going on in here. In ECI, the shape, what allows us to, to, to communicate better with our algorithms, the shape is given by the roles, the method names. Any clue what this is? Nah, rhetoric questions, no way to answer it. I mean, this is runtime code. This is a, these are object IDs. The fuck knows what's going on. What if we were to print the class names? What is this about? Are you starting hinting at what's going on? It's something with banks, right? Something with banks. That's what our clients ask of us. Do a feature that has something with banks. What if we were 
to print the rows. What is it? It's a transaction. It goes from a source account, that's the role that whatever we had prior, whether it's it saving, a checking account, any of these could either play the role of a source account and a destination account. And whether it's euro or krone or shekel, that's the amount that we, we send from one place to the other. Now the runtime, the machine, talks the same language as us. I mean, we can look at our code, and we don't necessarily have to unit test it to understand that this is what it will see as well. But how can we reach such a point? And my solution is radical. Our tooling is incomplete. I suggest a new language. Time for laser again. Now we don't have a class anymore for context. We do have a context. And its implementation allows us to own an intimate relationship with the roles it behind. There's going to be a mom, and there's going to be an IT guy, and a makeshift fighter, which each has its own algorithm. We don't have to do dirty checks anymore. We have a token, which is requires. The fun part about roles, and something that I despise about class-oriented programming, is that in order to implement an algorithm, we rarely need for the player, for the object, for the class, to fulfill the entire interface. I only need to know that my role player is able to speak because that's what my algorithm requires. That's the subset of the interface that I'm required to execute the algorithm. And then, this is the same file. I'll fit it on a slide and still be readable. This was the setup. This is the execution. Reflection API method programming in some languages, in some is possible, pass on blocks. So this is part of the first class implementation details. Now, question, I'm gonna answer it later. Do I have to use an, or invent a new language to, to do anything with CI? Not really, I'm gonna, not really, but yes, I'm, I'm gonna show you why. So far, talked about a lot of things. What is DCI? It's not a language, don't get me wrong. It's a way to reflect the user's mental model. It's very hard nowadays to reason just by looking at code, and then we blame the poor juniors, right, when we won't board them on our monstrous code bases. Behavior is put back within the boundaries of the human mental model. I can look at it, I can look at my use case and understand that I'm on the right path, right? Whereas you have your Algorithms spread all across classes, services, and other OOP patterns to make it work. OOP patterns. I mean, you know the Gang of Four book? I mean, the Gang of Four book is a collection of patchwork of workarounds around limitations. And let's talk about limitations. I mean, the fact that we finally have roles and data separated are not in the same class, we can eliminate the need for patterns such as strategy right, or state because there's little to no behavior variability in an object since it has no behavior. In a class-oriented program, the interaction between objects is not first class. It just happens here and there. You need, you need chain of responsibility. You need template programming, right? Template programming, which appear with C++, which the guy who took DCI from a state of theory to accepted practice was the one that brought up first the template programming abuse, which eventually transformed in generic programming. But we don't need that anymore. Because we can reason and actually design the interaction between use cases, right? That's what Software architecture, architecture design, put together constellations 
and the n constellation of constellations. And there is a very precise way in which we can actually design those interactions and we don't delegate it to the JFM, whose assumption is, we're stupid, JFM is smart, let's defer the actual implementation to it. And it's a way of separating what the system is from what the system does to lessen the stress we put on the system. No need to change things that change very rarely for stuff that changes often. If it's so good, why is it not popular? I told you there are darker forces at play, but I assure you, DCI is good. And this, I mean, people that are doing actual science and they're doing research, this is what they say about DCI. There, there was an experiment that has been repeated, right? Scientific experiments have methods, they have KPI, they have measures, they repeat it. And they say that they put together one group of Java people and one group of DCI people and asked them to develop the same thing. The DCI group outperformed the Java people every single time. Bonus, the DCI people were also Java people. So in spite of an extra learning curve, they still managed to outperform them in the same time. How did they outperform? They achieved the use cases much faster. They had less regressions. They had better conversations with the stakeholders in every possible way, right? And, and I mean, it happened at different universities with, with different group of scientists. Why is it still not the most popular thing on Earth right now? Why are not people hiring on LinkedIn for software architects with DCI knowledge? Because the world around us was made by people not much further than us. This is what Steve Jobs said. The world we live in was not made by the best computer science rationality. And I mean, Bjorn, one of the smartest guys we have in this industry, we got nothing on him. But even he admits it was a game of chance. This just happened to be. I worked with the best I had, not with the best there is. Right? The only thing we can do, if you are not in the same tribe that says, I'm closing my laptop, I go home, right? get paid in, and that's it. I mean, that's what I'm in for. And you actually care about having a better developer experience and, I mean, leaving a better legacy for those to come after you. You have to keep looking around. Is it worth it? You to decide. Darker forces that I've been, um, I've been cramming for for the finale is marketing, strategy, business. I mean, the big universal randomness that we are subjected to. Another story, and with this one I'm done. You know how we came to have JavaScript in the form it is? You know the Brandon Ike story at Manscaped? It was mandated to create a language for the web, for the browsers. And Brendan was a smart guy. Sit at the table. I mean, there is a legend that says he did the language in seven days. I don't know whether that is true or not. And he started working on a scheme dialect. Lisp. I have done that in, in university. Lots of parentheses, Hungarian math notation, right? You put the plus and then the, the numbers that you need to add afterwards. I mean, very obscure stuff. Do you think that we, if we have ended up with that stuff, you would not have used it? No, it would have been the most popular thing, right? Because you would have been locked in. People have to learn Objective-C, and that became one of the most popular languages, right? It's not that we are getting all together and decide, no, this is not good for us. All developers across the world. But he was working on this skin dialect, and at some point, the business people budged in. Brandon, what is this that you're working on? Well, I mean, uh, this is going to be the language of the web. Now this won't do. You know, nowadays, everybody is big about Java. All the developers know Java. If, if we want to have success, make it look more like Java. And that's how we ended up with, uh, with the weird language JavaScript was for a long time. Oh, but it's a very powerful one. Topic for another conversation. So he went back in the office and made it look 
more like Java. The base was still pretty much functional scheme. A couple of days later, the marketing guys buzzed in. And uh, Brendan, what's the name of the language? Well, I, I thought I would call it LiveScript because it enables you to, to, to give the user with a live experience about interacting with the web. No, 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 no. That won't do it either. Everyone is, is mad crazy about Java. We won't have success with a name like this. Make it sound more like Java. And we got JavaScript. Where is the best computer rationality? It was not the poor Brandon's fault we got out with this. But we do what we do because marketing and business people, not because of the best guild colleagues we have, best programmers of the world, decided that's going to be the design of the language. Uh, so the world around us was made by people not much smarter than us, with the exception of these two guys. <laughs> these are smart as fuck. There's Trickley, the gentleman who came up with MVC, with the concept of DCI. And then on the right, there's Jim, James Toplin, the guy who took DCI from a theory and made it an accepted practice. And it's currently its biggest promoter. Uh, we brought Jim to CPU. How many of you have been to, to I mean, any of these events that week? You've been to, to the workshops? To what? First time? Your first time here? No, he, he was not here. Some other place, but here in Sibiu. Are you also first time in Sibiu? I mean, Jim is a mastodon. I mean, he was the first promoter of C++ outside of Bell Labs, right? Bjorn invented it. He was one of the pioneers trying to make it popular. Generic programming, I mean, could be deducted from his work on templates in C++. I mean, the Gang of Four book is credited. I had a conversation with Jim. I mean, there, there, I mean, there are some concepts people need to know about this. And we need to put together a book of what? Workarounds, right? It took the work further and said, instead of continuing to patch our ecosystem, let's see if there's a way to make it actually better. And there are very few guys that are, that are bigger than, than him in our industry still alive, and he was here, right? for an entire week. He also delivered uh, Scrum workshops. Scrum is the other thing that he is big in. Uh, he, he can be credited for the daily stand-up, right? If you want someone to, to throw at. Extreme programming, it's also something that he came up with. It just happens that, I mean, history is not always on, on the side of, of the right party, of uh, the winner. Right? So, I mean, there's still a citation that says he came up with the thing, but if you were to search the inventors, it's not him. So he pretty much molded our entire ecosystem. I mean, he was here, and we talked, and he's willing to come again. And if you want to, to delve deeper into DCI, I mean, I, I, I think I, I could get him to come back for us to, to go into very deep, technical, softer things. Now... That was it. It was long enough, right? Thank you so much for, for your patience and attention. It's been a wonderful audience. Uh, I wasn't sure I'll get a chance to finish this right after the last attempt. Lesson is, be a software craftsman. Try to inform yourself whether We've been socialized in the world we have, and we've been told that this is what we have to work with but by the big corps angel companies. Not to call them evil. Or is there a better way to go about it? Is me who's supposed to do this? Who else? You're the smartest we've got. <laughs> if you don't step up, business people will budge in. And that's what the legacy we're going to leave on for our colleagues. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Got any questions? Well, most programming languages are not bad. I mean, most languages step out to bring difference to the writing pattern that you call enforcing patterns, right? And the PCI came up with languages all right mixing i mean this is a great conversation i mean it was part of my my topic in inclusion i omitted it completely i forgot about it so look you got mixins in ruby for example you can alter the dispatch list in python for example quite easily right i mean prototypal inheritance that was that was sweet as hell i mean you, you could patch your your objects javascript is it was for a long time the only true object oriented programming we, we are still writing objects right <laughs> we're opening objects but there's a problem what is the object made of in order to reason in terms of objects behavior data and identity you don't maintain identity but it's a, it's a matter of shape it's a matter it's a matter of shape uh, it, it, it was not a question, it's a conversation, but we can do this as well. It's also a matter of shape, right? I mean, DCI is an ideal case. And of course, we're going to be skeptic. We, we don't need ideal, right? I mean, the Ruby guy has been talking for a long time about developer happiness. And we said, what? Fuck that, we don't want happiness. We want runtime performance. We don't want to be happy, right? So it's, it's normal that we're going to have this level of skepticism. There are languages that enables full DCI, and I'm going to disclose those as well. Right? There are many implementations that try to make popular languages in the same strategy that the Java guys did. We need to appeal to the guys that are, are a bunch and just not a few select group. There's the implementation of DCI for, for the .NET uh, runtime, which is called Marvin. Um, the language that I presented you, I mean, that's just interpreted for, for Java, not because how much the community the DCI community loves Java, just but because there, there's a bunch of Java guys. And um, they do enable you to have DCI to a degree. When it comes to object identity, whenever you modify the dispatch list, it is not the same object in the runtime. And you have this thing called strict assertion, and it can be a very big problem. If your algorithm requires that you have the same entity and it's going to check, against it with the strict assertion operator, you're going to fail. You're going to, you're going to have a, a problem. You're going to have a bug. It's going to be hard to, to combine. Any, any C++ guys here? Sort of? I mean, you, you got this runtime assertion where a computer just I mean, faults if it, if it doesn't fit. I mean, those are extremely hard to debug, right? Extensions methods. When do you find that? All right. Another example, and it's in the same line. Rust. Are you doing Rust? No? Implement traits and implementations, right? You still need to be aware of the, the interface that the class already has. So the delegation is to the class. There's still a decoupling. You need to know what you extend to an implementation. Whereas in, in the role, the requirement is a partial interface requirement that is within the role. It's still separated. I mean, what? It's this at the pipeline. Alex, right? You gave me an idea. I'm going to have another topic. I said I'm done. Well, but I'm going to have another topic on this precise conversation, right? Com compile time versus runtime, and uh, and all the the ways we went around limitations of uh, of expressivity of, of of programming and how some solve and some don't. Scala is the only language that actually solves most of this problem. You can start doing this guy right away. Um, Scala is great. No problem with the JVM. See, my problem is with Java itself. Um, all right, thank you. Conversation, not a question, but good talk. Any other questions? Please. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, it was a paradigm shift. And it was, I mean, I, I've been asked this question before. It just happened to be. I mean, I, 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 was, I was lucky. I was privileged to, to meet James in, in a different context. And we, we talked about DCI. And uh, I mean, I, I, I came to him, I had a conversation. I was the only guy who had a conversation on DCI afterwards. And he said, oh, that, that's fantastic. You got it. You're smart. Go on and work on it. I came back to him. You're not that smart. You understood nothing. It was just an event of randomness because this is what our world is about. I liked it. It resonated with me. And I mean, if you know something that you like, and you know something that's good, and you know you believe, not know, right? I can only believe, not know for a thing, that it can improve our practice. You would love all the other people in the same boat you have a bucket as well. I mean, there might be eh, many more concepts and ideas about how can we improve. I don't know them all. You find out something, share with us. I'm going to be here. That, that. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. One more question. Bonus points, two questions. Oh, man. Oh, man. Sorry. Decline my pull request. <laughs> it's a context. It's not the class name. It's not data. It's a context. The context is on, I mean, I could call it visit to mom. Right? Verbs are methods. Classes are, are, are nouns. Right? I mean, that's the context. I never thought about it. I, I mean, context could be nouns as well. Visit to mom. No. How, how do I do that? It's a context. Let's talk about it. Thank you. That's it? Because, I mean, I, I mentioned this. It was initially in Scala. But then I had my conversation with my, with my friends, right, from, from the God companies. And we agreed that they all hate PHP for a reason or another. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to rewrite it in PHP for you, with dedication. No, no. And, and it's also one of these many languages, such as Ruby and, and Python and, uh, I mean, uh, C Sharp as well, where you can reach some sort of the connection between methods and, uh, and data to a certain degree. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm back here where I started. It's your, <laughs> it's all yours, man. Pay my for it. Asa. Reveni mă română. <coughs> Așa. Uh, câte va cuvinte mai vreau să zic înainte. Până la finalul anului, uh, până la final, finalul anului, uh, dăm drumul la uh, servă. O să mai aveți unul. Așa. Nu ne dă nimeni afară, deci putem să mai stăm să mai povestim. Nic, cu siguranță mai are chestii de spus. Pleci? Da, gata. Așa. Următorul meetup l-am programat în 18? În 18 ianuarie. De să fiți pregătiți tot aici, probabil, cu siguranță. Și... Da. Cam atâta am avut de spus pe anul ăsta. Ne vedem la anul. Sărbători fericite dacă nu ne mai vedem. Sărbători fericite. A, și stai, stai, stai. Mă, uh, dacă vreți să aflați mai multe și nu știți deja despre Meetup, scanați codul QR și Call for Speakers e în continuare deschis. Dacă vreți să aplicați, vă încurajez. Uite, și Nic vă încurajați să participați. Știți, ați, ați observat acum, ați văzut cum funcționează toată treaba. Deci, uh, vă aștept. <laughs>